Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to our church. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you for joining us. If you're joining us online, hello to you at home. Uh, you know, this morning as I'm looking around and I'm feeling the fall vibes, the, that Thanksgiving spirit, I just can't help but feel that hum of joy. Psalms 100 verse 4, it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Let us give thanks and bless his name. Why don't we stand together as we sing this first song, There's joy in the house of the Lord today. You may remember it. The chorus was super simple. We learned this a couple months ago. It goes like this. Yeah. 
Hinsdale Fell Am today. You can't be quiet with a song like that. So stay up, stay up. I want you to turn to somebody, hug them, tell them, happy Sabbath. We're glad you're here today. church we're so glad you're joining us today I tell you I told these young people I love that song it just makes you want to shout because this is God's house and I believe God wants us to be joyful and full of worship and praise amen all right today is a special Sabbath it's our Thanksgiving celebration Sabbath so you see a lot of things on the stage here today and I just want to give you a little promo. So at the end of the service today, for those of you who ordered your two pies, you're going to be able to get them at the end of the service. If you did not order a pie, no worry. We have a few extra. So you come up at the end of the service and talk to Sandra. She has a few extra. So if you didn't get a pie, here's the question. What do you do with your pie? It's for your neighbors. It's not for you. So if I catch you eating that on Sabbath, I think it's going to be a curse, okay? Buy your own for your home. So here's the thing is, we want you to take two pies and give it to two neighbors. But we don't want you to give it to neighbors that you know. We want you to give it to neighbors that you don't know that well. Because we believe that food is a wedge to connect with people. So you try it, and you're going to tell us how that works, okay? So pies today after church, you can get them. Man in ministry, the kids packed some food baskets today. We're calling them blessing bags. So on your way out today, we want you to grab your pies, grab a blessing bag. There is an address and a name on the bag. Very easy. You simply take it to the home, take it to their door, preferably knock and maybe engage the family but if not just leave it but here's the one ask is that you pray on that food okay in your car on the sidewalk we don't care where but pray for that family that's going to be blessed today okay so big sabbath in the middle of our service we're going to give you an opportunity to give our annual thanksgiving gift to the lord if you don't have an envelope like this Raise your hand for me. We're going to pass one out to you right now. And the good news is, if you don't have an envelope, no worries. You can do it online. Adventist giving, do it online. We're going to have a QR code up there. You can do it any way you want. Okay? So today, special Thanksgiving offering later on in the service. And then this week, we want you guys to join us for two other events. For the last several years, we've been going to our first responders in Hinsdale, the police, the fire, and we give them a Thanksgiving gift. And we pray for them, and we tell them thank you for serving us. And one of the things we give them is something like this. So, Pastor Nesta, stand up and show them. This is a sample of what we're going to give them. But we take it to them, and we pray for them. And we would love for you as church members to join us if you're available. We usually, I'm trying to get the final time from Mark, but I think we do it, we're going to do it on Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. So I'm just making that up. If there's a problem, I'll communicate with you. But if you're available, go with us. And, and, and the firefighters, the police, they just love when churches thank them for what they do. Okay, so join us. And then lastly, this Thursday... What day is Thursday? Thanksgiving. Hinsdale Philam for 40 years. 
have always done a Thanksgiving program, and we're continuing that tradition. So 10 a.m. right here for one hour, we're going to have a little Thanksgiving program and then a little food afterward. Now, we're not making a big meal like we used to, but the ladies are going to prepare something sweet and something um, for you so you don't have to do anything but show up, okay? So Thanksgiving, Sabbath, Thanksgiving Day, 10 a.m., right here at the church, one hour Thanksgiving service. You got all that? Now, why do we do all this, by the way? We do it because we're so grateful to God for all the good things he's done for us all year long. And you know what the holidays, folks, is a chance to minister in a way that we never get all year long because people's hearts are open to talk about God, to do good things. So you're going to see a lot of activity in this next month for this church. So you better get your rest. You better put comfortable shoes on because we're going to engage every Sabbath with ministry because that's what God called us to do. Because I know God's been good to me. He certainly has been good to you. Amen? All right. Children, it's time for our children's story. Oh, I got it. We're going to invite the children down for the children's story right now, Pastor Rodney's going to tell you a story. But while I'm doing that, I'm going to do a first reading for transfer of membership. First reading, we don't have to vote today, for Heidi Davis. Heidi Davis. And Heidi is one of our school teachers at HAA. She's singing up, up front. She's engaged in ministry and worship. And we want to welcome her to our church next Sabbath officially, if you're here. But um, this is the first reading, Transfer of Membership for Heidi. Thank you. God's going to bless us today as we worship through you guys. So thank you. All right, come on up, kids. Good morning, boys and girls. Come on up. We have a special Lamb's Corner children's story for you this morning. Come on up. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Can I hear a happy Sabbath? One more time. Happy Sabbath. Oh, that's still so quiet. I know you guys are loud. One more time. Happy Sabbath. All right. So we have a special Sabbath. Do you see all these bags around you? You guys helped out this morning, right? So I want to share you this quick story from the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was sad. Can you show me a sad face? Hmm, show me sad face. Hmm, I'm so sad. Nehemiah was so sad because he, his, his people were not in the right place. And the king noticed. And this is, what, this is what it says in chapter 2. The king said to me, what is it you want? Nehemiah was sad, remember? Show me sad. Hmm. And this is how he responded in verse 4. It's, the king said to, him, to me, what is it you want? And this is his response. He prayed to the God of heaven. Now, he was talking and responding to the king. But who does he really want to answer to? The king of kings. Not Burger King, the king of kings. So here's a special thing. 
when we pray, we're praying to the king of, king of kings. That we have a power like none other. That we could tap by just praying to God, say, Lord, help me. Then the king of kings stands up and he listens to all of your prayers. Huh? Pancake, yeah. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to do a special prayer. And you know when we do a special prayer, when we pray over something special, you know what we're going to do? We're going to ask for the king's seal over these bags. The king's seal means that you are giving, the st God is going to give the stamp of approval over these bags. Now look around you. Look at the bags. Do you see names on them? Look at them. Do you see names? See all these bags? are going to go to those who are in need this special Thanksgiving week. So what we're going to do, go ahead and stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Go around the bags, and I want you to put your hand over them. Find a bag, and then put your hand over them. Just put your hand over them. Go ahead, find a bag. There's some bags over here. Go ahead, right there. Go ahead. Find a bag, find a bag. And we're going to pray over them. And we're going to ask the King of Kings for a stamp of approval over these bags. Because when we pray over them, we're going to ask God to bless them. That whoever it goes to, that they may feel blessed and know that God cares for them and God loves them. So are you guys ready to pray to the King of Kings? Let's pray, over to, pray to the King of Kings. Let's pray. Put your hand down. Put your hand over it, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we give us this opportunity to serve. We want to live by your example. You didn't come to be served, but to serve. So help us, Father, as we put our hands over these bags, that these bags may help those in need. Thank you, Father, Lord, that though we may answer to the kings of this world, we answer ultimately to the King of kings the one who has power over all of them. So thank you, Father, for being a wonderful king, and we ask, Father, for your stamp of approval over all of these bags. Be with us and be with the kids. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, kids. Go back to your, go back to your seats. Probably the most common question that we'll hear this week is, what are you thankful for? It's something that as parents, we ask our kids and we share around the family table. And this morning, I, you know, asked, I took a stock. What was I thankful for? And there are three things I'm thankful for specifically today. Number one is my dad got into a car accident just yesterday, a small one, and he could have lost his life. Um, but he ended up going to the hospital and had a successful surgery this morning. So first, I'm very thankful that uh, my mom texted me and said that he's okay, that he's strong. Um, God has been with him in this, and he will be with him in the recovery this week. Second, I'm thankful for thankful for my wife around this time last year I was getting really nervous because I was about to propose and I had an inkling that she would say yes but I wasn't a hundred percent sure and thank God praise God she said yes and now we're married today um, and she's here with us and we're serving here Third, I'm really thankful for the vision and mission of this church specifically. We have felt so embraced by everyone here. Um, as Pastor Nestor is talking about gospel generosity, I can't help but think of just the past month and a half, we have seen every one of you, your faithfulness in time, talent, and treasure for God's kingdom. And some of you may have received a letter last week for our annual Thanksgiving gift. So at this time, we will have our annual Thanksgiving gift to further our mission and our vision which is our commitment to make disciples for Jesus and to magnify Jesus in worship. So we're going to sing Give Thanks um, as appropriate for our, our church service and our Thanksgiving celebration today. And there is an offering basket here for those 
who have prepared with the envelope for our Thanksgiving gift that goes specifically to furthering our vision in this community for 2023. There are many things that we want to do as a church family. We are praying through those things in our Wednesday night prayer pursuit. So we invite you to come forward with those offerings now as we sing Give Thanks. There is a QR code um, that I believe we can put. Can we put a, a screen up of the offering code for Adventist giving right under local church offering? There should be an option to uh, select Thanksgiving offering. So I believe it's the regular, yep, the regular time offering. So if you have your cell phone and want to give online instead, then there's that QR code right behind me that you can um, scan and it'll take you to our Adventist giving page. There it is. Let's sing together.
kneel together for prayer this morning. Great are you, Lord, O oh God Almighty. You are great. You are worthy to be praised. And so this morning, as the song says, we pour out our breath to you, Lord, in gratefulness and thankfulness for everything you do for us, Lord. This morning, we give you thanks, Lord, for waking us up this glorious day. We give you thanks, Lord, for your protection, not only of ourselves, but for our loved ones. We give you thanks, Lord, for our health, for our strength. We give you thanks for your grace, for your forgiveness. We give you thanks for your joy and your peace that you give us. We give you thanks for loving us unconditionally. We give you thanks for never failing us. God, we just thank you today for every blessing that we have. And there may be some here this morning thinking to themselves, well, I'm not that blessed. Father, we just have to look beyond ourselves to look around the world and we realize how really blessed we are to live in this country. Lord, and for those that are struggling, that are, are, are maybe having some difficult times, we, we also claim your promise that in the Bible that says, give thanks in all circumstances, the good, the bad, because this is your will for us. God, because when we thank you, when we declare how great you are, we will receive a peace that the Bible says is beyond understanding. And so this morning, God, we declare, great are you, Lord. We declare, thank you, God. And we just praise your name. And this Thanksgiving time of the year, Lord, there are so many people there that are struggling and there's so many opportunities to serve and so I challenge us as a church to look for opportunities to minister, to serve, to be a word of encouragement. Lord, I pray for these pies that you see behind us. We pray for the blessing bags that are going to go out today. We just pray that every heart that is, that is going to receive these blessings will be touched and be drawn closer to you. And we may not even realize in the short term the blessing, the influence, but we trust, God, that every blessing, every pie, every food item will resonate in a heart today. And, and that little heart will be turned closer to you. And so today, Lord, as we celebrate all the good things you've done for us, we lift up Pastor Nest in a special way. Use him this morning. Speak through him this morning. May his words be your words. And may our hearts be receptive to the teaching this morning. Thank you, God, in advance for the blessing of this day and the blessing of the week to come. In your name we pray. Amen. It's good to see everyone here today. Welcome, happy Sabbath to you. Those watching online, we're so glad that you've joined us as well. Do you feel the spirit of thanksgiving? I mean, not just know, but do you feel it today? It's, is, it, is it because thanksgiving is right around the corner or is it because we, we sense the spirit of the Lord here? I definitely sense the spirit of the Lord here. Thank you, praise team, for ushering us into God's presence with the music and leading us in worship. Thank you to our Man and Ministry team and our Sabbath School young people who have put these bags together and our outreach team that has put together these pies. Can we give God a round of applause <clears throat> for using our teams to bless others? 
Let me pray before I start. I just can't help myself but pray. Lord, in the midst of uh, turmoil, Jeremiah cries out in Lamentations chapter 3, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions, they fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. We thank you so much for your goodness toward us. And we thank you that you can use us today to be good to others. Thank you for your generosity, which helps us to be generous. And I pray that as we discover today's teaching, that you would, unlo you would unlock a generous heart within us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm excited about today's message. You know, I'm excited about this sermon series. Where we started a sermon series last week entitled Gospel Generosity. We learned last week a, about time, how God would have us use our time. And we learned that delighting in God is more important and more essential than just doing things for God. Today we're going to learn about treasure. Next week we're going to learn about uh, our talent. How, what does God expect of us and how we use our talent for God. But today we're going to learn about treasure. We're going to learn about the treasure that you and I have in our bank accounts. We're going to learn about our possessions. And as we start this teaching, I have a question for you. Have you ever wondered why it's sometimes hard for you, why it's sometimes hard for us to give to a charity or to give to a church or to give to someone in need? Come on, we've all been there before, driving in our cars, panhandlers asking for money. And it's hard for us sometimes. It's hard for us to be generous. This morning, what we're going to do is we're going to learn not only how we can be generous, but we're going to learn what unlocks generosity so that we can give of our treasure to those in need. So what we're going to do is we're going to go right to the book of Luke, all right? We're not going to waste any time. We're going to go right to our passage. Come with me. Luke chapter 12. You have to see it with your own eyes. If you have your Bible, that's great. If you have a digital Bible, that's okay too. We're in Luke chapter 12, all right? And we're going to unpack and discover how God can unlock generosity in our hearts, all right? So let's go Luke chapter 12. Starting with verse 32. Now here's Jesus speaking. Please listen. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. 33. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Right? Be generous. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. Now do not miss verse 34. This is a foundational verse in this passage. Notice what Jesus says. For where your treasure is, which we're learning about today, right? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, that's where my heart is. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What's up with this thing called the heart? What is the heart anyway? There are at least two things we learn from this verse about the heart. Number one, our heart reveals what we love. Our heart reveals what we love. My heart reveals what I really treasure. Now, how do we know what I really love and what I really treasure? I know that I really love something or treasure something because if I were to lose it, I could hardly live anymore. If I lose that thing that I love and that I treasure, <laughs> I can't breathe. I can't live anymore because I've lost it. Now, it's okay to like things, but when things become the supreme object of our affection, it becomes a problem. Now, what are some things that we love and that we treasure and that our heart reveals that we love? Think about our cars. All right, I remember I, my first car was a... Um, a purple Honda Civic. It was really pink, but I'd like to say it was purple. This Honda Civic 1994 coupe. I love that car. Then I got a new car, a Honda Civic 2006, and I'm a Honda fan, of course. But we love our cars. We lo some of us, we love our houses. We love our retirement accounts. We love our savings account. Some of us really love the Bulls. Any Bulls fans here? All right? We love the Bulls. We love the Bears. I, know, I have some friends who are 
diehard Bears fans. And you know, people really love and treasure a game. I remember I was watching the Golden State Warriors in Denver, playing the Denver Nuggets a few years ago. And you should have seen all the Denver Nuggets fans like trash talking the Warriors. Who do they love and they treasure? They love the Denver Nuggets. We love our work. In fact, some of us, when, when we lose our work, we, we, we ask ourselves, who am I? Many of, some of us are retired. We worked from about 25 to 65, so 40, 40 plus years of our lives. And once we stop working, we're like, what do I do with my life? Who am I? We treasure our work. We treasure our jobs. We treasure our spouses. We treasure our children. Here's something that I became aware of that we treasure and love. I treasure and I love my rightness. You know what that is? Those of you who are in relationships, you're, you're dating, you're in marriage, you understand this. Those of you who are parents, you understand this. You love, I love my rightness. Especially when we're having a disagreement, I love to tell you that I'm right. And if I lose my rightness, if I lose, my, if I lose that treasure of my rightness, uh, all hell breaks loose, right? Another, another way to look at this is our heart reveals m- more about, our heart reveals more than what we believe in. We can say that we believe in something, but our heart really tells, tells you what my heart really believes. Let me, let me ex- illustrate it this way. I remember 20 years ago when I became a born-again Christian. You see, I grew up within the Seventh-day Adventist faith tradition, but I didn't become a Christian until age 19. Do you understand the, the difference between the two? You can grow up in the tradition, but then I was born again, meaning I fell in love with Christ, and he did something in my heart. And I remember there in my, 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 my early conversion experience, I would quote this text, Ephesians chapter 2, 8, for by grace you are, you are saved through faith. And I would tell everyone, I believe with all my heart that I am saved by God's grace. But then when you looked at how I lived, I was living like, all right, I shouldn't watch this, and, and uh, if I eat this, this pizza, God, please forgive me. Like, I, I, would, I was living according to these rules. And so while I would tell people that I believe in grace, the love of my heart was really myself and my perfection and my behavior. Another way to illustrate it is this way. There are, there are some people who say, I am of a believer in Christ, and and uh, I, I call myself a Christian, but then the question is, can people tell that I'm a Christian by the things that I say and the things that I consume and the, 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 the words that I share? What, what, the, what the heart does, the heart reveals what we really love. That's the first thing. The second thing we learn about the heart is this, and this is scary, friends. Our heart controls us. Our heart controls us. Now, what is the heart? I'm going to pull out my uh, trusty white pad here. I know Jason always teases me about this. Check this out. In ancient Greece, okay, so we'll call it G stands for Greeks, okay? Can you guys see that? Uh, They would say that the mind, that's an M, and the will is greater than what they called emotions. And they called that the... The heart. Let me, let me just color it. I should get a red marker so you can see it better. There you go. Okay? So in ancient Greece, it was mind over emotions. What's, look, you can't follow your passions. Uh, you can't follow your emotions. Mind and your decision and your decision, your will to, 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 to uh, follow your mind has to supersede your emotions. Okay? In modern day culture, in the culture that we are living in here in modern Western world in 2022, almost 2023, we'll call this modernity, right? So modern culture, guess what reigns supreme? My emotions, right? There's the heart, is greater than the what? My mind and the will. Meaning, I express my worth and I find my identity because I authenticate my identity because my feelings tell me so, okay? A prime example of this, I've quoted this a few months ago, uh, let it go, let it go, can't, what, what's the words again? 
Can't hold it back anymore. I, I, let it go, let it go. Turn, uh, turn around and slam the door. I don't care what you say or something like that. Then the storm, let the storm rage on, right? The storm of tradition and mind and will and what everyone else says never bothered me anyway. Because what's most, most important is my heart. And I know who I am because my heart tells me that I am this way, right? This is the Greek culture, ancient culture, mind over emotion, mind and will over emotions. Modern culture, emotions over mind and will. When the Bible uses the term heart, a lot of us think that, well, we, we, we differentiate between mind and heart, right? Between intellect and emotions and will. But that actually comes from ancient Greek thought. There was no dualism. If you read all of, all of the passages, I read a lot of passages about, about the heart in Scripture, you'll find out that the heart is attached to the mind, that the heart is attached to, to the will, and it's attached to the emotions. In fact, the biblical understanding of the heart looks like this. Bible, all right? This is what the biblical heart looks, looks like. You all can see that, right? I know, it's not, I'm not the best artist. You got the mind... You have the will, and you have the emotions. If you look at scripture, the heart is actually the seat of our mind, will, and emotions. Prime example, tr Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, with everything. Trust in the Lord who you know, yes, Trust him emotionally. Trust him with your will. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. The heart, friends, is the control center. It's not just emotion. The heart, according to biblical thinking, is the seat of, our, of, of mind, will, and emotions. That it's the control center. So this is, what, this is, this is where it hits home for us. Whatever we love most will control us. Whatever that you and I love the most will control us. I, I liken it, as I was reviewing this, I was thinking, what, what's a good illustration? I liken it to a steering wheel. Many of us drive here, right? Wherever we want to go, we turn left. We want to go this way, we turn right. The heart functions like a steering wheel, and it follows the object that it loves. So let me give you an example. I remember, so I, I grew up, I took piano lessons, and I think it was around 2002 or three that I started learning to play guitar. And I really loved playing guitar. I, I would buy, I would get free guitar tabs for music that I liked. And I would stay up till three or four, even five in the morning. Sometimes my, my fingers would get calloused. Guitar players, you know, that, you know that feeling, right? When your fingers get calloused. Sometimes your fingers bleed because you play so much. It happened to me one time. But... I was, my heart was so passionate and in love with learning the piano that I would stay up till 3, 4, even 5 in the morning. Because, because the guitar, learning to play guitar was what? Was steering me, right? My heart was steered by my, my love to learn guitar, right? Another example would be uh, um, young lovers. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, she messaged me on Facebook. Hey, whoo. She direct messaged me. <laughs> what? Hey, I saw her at a party. Whew. She said hi to me. Then a conversation starts, right? You, know, you, don't, you don't want to be too creepy. You start off by saying, hey, um, nice to know you. You chat for 20, 15 minutes. It's like, hey, I got to go because you don't want to look too desperate, right? <laughs> and then you spend time together, right? Young lovers spend time together. Um, 30 minutes turns into an hour, two hours, three hours. You're on FaceTime for two, three, four hours. And time passes. Why? Because your heart is steering you toward the object of your affections. The heart steers us and controls us. And it chases after the object of, our, of, of, the, of its affections. What we have to pay attention, friends. We have to pay attention to what we really love because whatever we treasure will control us. Let me say that again. We have to pay attention to what we really love 
because what we really love will control us. And the question is, what's controlling you? What's controlling me? Well, all I have to do is ask, what do I love the most? How did I spend my time? What did I think about this past week? And that will do a good job of revealing what I really love. According to our passage this morning, the heart has two objects of his affections. In other words, the heart, this heart, has two treasure options. What did I say? Two <laughs> treasure options, all right? Treasure option number one. All right, let's go. Luke now in verse 13. We're Luke 12, verse 13. Here we go. All right, so my heading says here in my Bible, the parable of the rich fool. All right, here we go. Verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Ah, there it is. There's the first thing, guys. Here's, here's treasure option number one. We're going to call this... I don't know if you could read that. Goods. Jesus, tell my brother to give me my inheritance. To give me uh, my, my due of the portion of, of money. <laughs> Jesus, t t tell my brother I want my goods. All right? That's it. Treasure option number one. Goods. What's the problem with that? Look at verse 14. Here we go. Look what Jesus says. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? Come on, am I, am I a judge? Am I an arbitrator? Don't miss verse 15. He said this. And he said to them, not just him, but to everyone that was listening, his disciples and everyone that was listening, verse 15, take care and be on your guard against all, what word does your version say? My version says covetousness. Beware. Take care, be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. What? Uh, this can't come at a perf more perfect time. We have Christmas around the corner, and, and, and shopping malls are making money like, like there's no tomorrow. Because everyone right now wants goods and goods and goods. Abundance, abundance, abundance. And come on, let's be honest. Yeah, we buy it for our friends, but we're also, we're also sneaking a, a little treat or two or five or ten, some sales at the coat rack or sales at the store. We're sneaking it in there too. Come on, we know that. Goods, 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 goods. And Jesus says life does not, there is more to life than the accumulation of goods. There's more to life than goods. What does that word covetous mean, covetousness mean anyway? Greed. <laughs> Greed. It's like kids at the, to the toy section at Target. Mommy, I really need that. And I need that one, and I want that. Mommy, please, please, Daddy, please. I want, I want, I want, I want. When I was reviewing this message last night, I actually uh, remembered Ariel from The Little Mermaid. Do you remember that, that old movie? And I, for some reason, I don't know why I, I thought about this, but check this out. Look at this stuff. Isn't it neat? Wouldn't you think my collection's complete? Would you think that I'm the girl, the girl who has everything? Look at this trove of treasures untold. How many wonders can one cavern hold? Looking around here, you would think, surely she's got everything. I've got gadgets and gizmos aplenty. I've got who's it's and what's it's galore. You want thingamabobs? I've got... 20, right? You guys know the song. But who cares? No big deal. I want less. Is that what Ariel says? I want more and more and more. And guys, this is coming from 1989. That's when the film was made. I'm dating myself. I watched it all the time in the 90s. I want more. I want more. I want more. I want more goods. And she's a mermaid, right? And she's like, I want to become like a human being, and I want what they have. I want their goods. I want more and more and more and more and more. Please give me more and more and more and more. I mean, that's what Jesus said in verse 15. He said, he said um, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness against this more and more goods and more goods and more goods and more goods for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. 
what is the problem with greed, friends? What is the problem with greed? Uh, check this out. Look at verses 16 through 21. Check this out. Look what Jesus says. And he said to them a parable. I love how Jesus taught principles. Yes, he, was, he wasn't so direct, but he gave a direct lesson, and he gave this parable to this man. He said this. The land of a rich man produced plentifully, in verse 17. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years, relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, where will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You see what the problem is? The problem with greed and with goods is what? It leaves us, you guys see that? Leaves us dissatisfied. We're never really satisfied, are we? We're never really satisfied with enough goods. You know that verse, in verse 19, Jesus says, or the, the, the rich man says, uh, relax, I will relax now, I will eat, I will drink, and I will be merry. Ah, I want to be. Ex I want to be comfort. I want to be. I want to be comfortable. You know, uh, the, this was a common expression in both Jew Jewish and Greek literature, and the motto was like the basically was like this: seek comfort and pleasure abo above everything else in life. Like the whole purpose of your existence is to enjoy comfort and pleasure. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was driving with Catherine, so we're both city kids, right? I grew up in the city of Chicago, North Side. Catherine grew up in Jakarta, Indonesia, right? And we're driving to this, this uh, sensory park in Naperville. Awesome place, 10 minutes from our house. And it was 70, de 70 degree weather. Do you remember that day uh, a, a few weeks ago? It was 70 degrees. I put the, the sun, you know, I, I put the sunroof down. The breeze was coming in. I said, Catherine, this is a good life. 70 degrees, going to the park with the kids. Man, we're comfortable. We're comfortable. Nothing wrong with comfort. And when I think about the plight, right, you think about the plight of many of, of us who have, whose, whose parents or uh, some of us who have come from another country, we come here, usually come to a city because there's more opportunity, but why do people move out of the city into the suburbs? Because it's more comfortable. There's more space. There's more convenience. And so we move, we move from, 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 from opportunity, which is discomfort, you know, uncomfortable with, with, you know, we can pass the salt to our neighbor right, right, right across the, <laughs> the house next to us. And then we just become, we become more comfortable, more comfortable, more comfortable. We end up idolizing comfort so that when we go back home, I remember when I went to my, my parents, my, my mom's home in the Philippines, it's like, I don't know, 2000, late, late, 19, late 1900s, right? 1998, 1999, visiting the Philippines. I'm like, okay, first of all, they don't have a shower here in this house. I have to use a pail of cold water to take a shower. There's no hot water here. Like, are you serious? And I have to flush the toilet with water too? And I've worshipped comfort so much that when I go into another setting that's uncomfortable, ah, oh, my life is over. I'm... Life is ending right now. And the problem is, there's nothing wrong with comfort, friends. But the problem is when we worship excessive comfort and excessive pleasure, when I don't have that anymore, I'm not satisfied. I, let, me, let me illustrate this way. I remember we, I was at a church one time, and one lady, we were go, all going to knock on doors. And, and, and one lady came to me, and she said, Pastor, I can't knock on doors and, and, and pray for people. And you know what she said? Because that's not my spiritual gift. And in my mind, God bless her, but in my mind I thought, are you using scripture to justify your discomfort? And I think we do the same thing. Like we will come up with whatever excuse as long as it's not as long as it's, it's, it's uh, not comfortable, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm to uh, 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 find an excuse. 
And the problem with this man is that he thinks, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to live comfortably. I'm just going to live pleasurably. And that's, that's, the, that's the essence of my life. Uh, that's not, that's not going to work. And then notice what he says in verse 18. He says, after he gets uh, this plentiful bounty, he says, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and I will build larger ones. Uh, more. A bigger barn. Bigger house. Bigger car. In fact, the life then becomes all about gain, goods, unhappy, gain. Because I think I'm going to be happy if I have more goods. But it's a cycle. Goods, not happy, gain. More goods. Yeah, it ha- satisfies me for a little bit, but a- a- I got to get more. And that becomes the driving philosophy of our lives. Gain, 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 gain. Accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. We chase the American dream. Nothing wrong with the American dream. Thank God we're in, an oppor- we're, we're in a land where we have the opportunity, where, where pretty much most people are, are all the same level. And, and if they work hard and, 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 and they're, they're diligent and, and they respect and they're, they're kind to of people, that they can, they can make a dream for themselves that they've never had before in, in the country that they came from. But here's what I've seen. So you come here, we come here, and we buy a nice car and a, and a nice house. You make a little bit more, and what happens? You know what? I think I need 600, I, th- I think I need 1,000 square feet, uh, an additional 1,000 square feet. More and more and more. And what I've seen is that we chase the American dream so much, that we chase goods so much, that we actually have to work overtime to support those goods. And those goods end up controlling our life, and we think we're happy, but we're not. We buy goods, and then the goods control us. Come on, those of us who are techies, I remember the first iPhone came out, right? I had like an iPhone 6, then an iPhone 8 Plus. Now I I bought this, I don't know, several months ago, this iPhone uh, 13 mini. And I remember telling myself, you know what, as as, uh, delighted and enamored I am by this piece of technology, in a few months that's going to fade. And guess what? I don't care that it falls. I have a, you know, OtterBox. I'm not getting any kickbacks for just telling you about OtterBox. But it falls on the floor. I don't care because the new one's going to come out. Right? Goods, 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 goods. Goods, 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 goods. And, and Solomon has something to say this. He said, hey, guys, Ecclesiastes chapter, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Look, verse 4, I made great works. I built houses, planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forests of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of men. I had everything. I had all the goods. I had everything. Gain, 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 gain. Goods, gain, 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 gain. Goods, 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 goods. And you know what he said in verse 11? Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it and behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind and there was nothing to be granted gained under the sun. Come on, go to King Solomon and ask him, Solomon, were you really happy? Nope. All the goods that I had was vanity. And I lived for this and it consumed my life. Solomon, you have something to teach me. All right, Solomon, I see what you're saying. You were the king and you had everything and you were still never really satisfied. Thank you for telling me, Solomon. You see, goods never really satisfy us. So what does? What does? Check out verse 29, 29 to 31. Luke 12, 29 through 31. And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. And notice what he says. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. So treasure option number one is goods. Treasure option number two is God. All right? That's treasure option number two. Not goods. God. Seek his kingdom. Seek him. And why is it, now follow me here, okay? Put your thinking caps on, follow me. Why is it that following God is more satisfying than goods? Well, I had never seen these connections before in scripture. 
And this is what's so awesome about gospel bias. Like I can't help but see Jesus and his love and his sacrifice for me in every passage of scripture. It just oozes out of every passage. Verse 32. This, my friends, I believe is the anchoring verse for the entire, for the parable and for his admonitions here. He says, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What? It is the father's joy and delight, the extreme happiness of his heart. To what? To give. That's his joy. So what's the connection between his joy and my joy? I had never seen this, guys. Check this out. I'm so excited about this. What, well, by the way, what did he give? Do you know what he gave? What is that? He gave us his son. What is the connection between giving us his son and my happiness? All right, check this out. You guys ready? Ah, oh, watch this. Verse 22. Are you ready? Here we go. Oh, I'm so thrilled about this. Uh, Luke 12, 22. And he said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. Don't be anxious about goods, 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 even the necessities of life. Don't be anxious, don't be anxious, don't be anxious. And then he says in verse 23, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Verse 24, consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, they, neither store, they, they have neither storehouse nor barn, yet God feeds them. And then he says this line I've never seen before, well I've seen it before, but I never saw it saw it through the gospel lens, of how much more value are you than the birds? Have you guys seen the birds drop on your tree? I've seen, I've seen woodpeckers, you know, I don't know how he doesn't hurt his head, but it's like pecking at, pecking at my crab, crab, crab apple tree in my house. And God takes care of the, the, the woodpecker. And he's saying, Nestor, you are far more exceedingly valuable to, value, valuable to me than a woodpecker. Which means that he gives because, check this out, is these last, he gives because he treasures me. Because I'm valued. Like, I am worth it. Say it with me. I am worth it. He gives his life because I am worth it. I am worth it. I'm treasured. I'm loved. I'm adored. I'm the apple of his eye. I am the reason why Jesus came. He loves me. And that, my friends, is why I can be infinitely happy. Because I, I treasure God, right? I treasure, uh, let's say I treasure this flower. Tre flower, I really treasure you. Can the, treasure, can the flower give me any treasuring back or love back? No. Now, I go on a special date with my wife and we sit. And she says, I tell her I love you. And she says, Nestor, I love you. Meaning, I treasure you. Feels good. But I know that we're human beings and it can't last forever. But I would look at, when I look into Jesus' eyes, who is of eternity, he says, hey, I gave you my life. You know why? Because I treasure you. And that's your source of happiness. My source of happiness is not in, what, in the, the goods that I gain, but in the God who gives me his life because he treasures me. Are you, are, you guys, are you guys catching what I'm, you guys picking up what I'm laying down here? Like, I'm treasured and I'm satisfied. My cup is not empty or half empty. My cup is actually full. It's so full that it's overflowing with generosity because God gives his life for me because he treasures me and he values me and he loves me. And so check this out. What then can I do since I'm satisfied and I'm overflowing with satisfaction? And this, friends, is what happens. Right there. Then I can give. 
You know why a lot of people don't, are scared about giving to people? And we're scared to, to share our money? Is because many of us, myself included, are so stuck on this philosophy of gaining goods that I believe my goods actually give me happiness. And if I give a little bit about my goods, then I'm gonna lose, my, I'm gonna lose some of my happiness. But if I have been unlocked by the love of God, that he has given his life for me, and that he did it because he treasures me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, he loves me so much that he gave, that's a source of my happiness. And so when I give, I'm not giving from an empty tank, I'm actually giving from a full tank. Because I have so much gratitude and, and love in my heart. Because I give because my heart's overflowing, I'm not empty. And you know, I was in the shower today, uh, and some of the, my greatest ideas come in the shower. And um, I was thinking to myself, uh, why, why, is it, why, is that, why is it that many of us are not, are not happy with ourselves? Because we're trying to fill that God-shaped hole in our hearts with goods, like material stuff or even relationships or even our work. The stuff that we do, we try to fill that thinking that's going to make us happy. And if, as long as I continue to live that way, I'm only going to think gain, 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 gain because I'm trying to become, I'm trying to add value to, to myself. Because I'm, I'm trying to, by the goods and the relationship that, that relationships that I'm in and, and, and by my, my, my work and my production, what I do with my hands, um, then, then that's the philosophy of my life and, and that's the root of my happiness. But if my happiness is not in goods, which is temporal, but in God, which is eternal, and it's in a relationship with this God who gives his life for me and that treasures me, I have unlimited value and unlimited happiness and self-worth. Like, I don't have to give from empty. I, I, I give. And that's why Jesus said here, I never saw this connection. That's why Jesus said in verse 31, instead, seek his kingdom, seek God, and then these things, the necessities of life, will be added. Like, I, I'm already valuable and worthy and treasured by him. So does this, do, these, do these goods and this, this fancy tech really add value to who I really am? No, I'm already valued in him. I'm valued in him. And when, when we're valued in God, we're satisfied, which gives us the heart to give. Let me share a, a few things here, and then we're done. So what does giving look like? In, a com in the community of faith, uh, at least within a church context, we give 10%. We call it a tithe. 10% of our gross income, right? Pre-tax. And it's not like we're giving it to God. We're returning it to him, according to Malachi, right? 10%. Well, there's, there's tithe. And, and within the, the Seventh-day Adventist community of faith, the structure, Tithe, all of that, that 10% that we, we give back to God actually goes up to uh, our, our, the our governing channel, the conference, and we don't see it. And it comes back to, to help pay gospel workers like myself and teachers and, and other gospel workers. Well, what about, what about offering? Okay. What about offering? Let me write something on here. So you have 10% tithe. In this church historically, 39 years of existence, we're hitting 40 years, I have, I have heard this number that if families were to give, if every family unit were to give 3.5% of their gross, so 10 plus 3.5, donated to the local church budget, we would be thriving. You know where we're at right now? We're at about, I don't know, 1.9. And if we were to get closer to that number, we can, we can continue to do gospel work. And I wonder to myself, what, would, what is next year going to look like? I'm excited about next year's plans. In the first, the first time of this church's history, we're actually going to have a disciplined church budget. And we're going to vote that in church and business. That means that all members are invited to, to attend and, 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 and hear about this new budget. We're going to have a budget for 2023 to have disciplined spending so that we could spend toward getting the gospel and God and, and his, his love out. And also what the board voted on was they didn't vote the team they didn't vote the team yet but I'm really excited about this our church voted to have a to start a visioning team okay a few weeks ago some of you don't know this 
we were so excited about a church 10, 10, 10 minutes down the road, thinking, oh, this is going to be the next church. But we weren't ready financially. But you know what? Before that, we, weren't, we didn't have a vision of who we are and who we want to become. So this visioning team is going to be formed by the end of this month and going to be meeting regularly next year to discover who we are and who does God want us to become so that we can have a plan for our finances and the next building that we're going to have. All of this happening, and I'm wondering to myself, could it be that God is touching our hearts so that, and knowing that we are treasured and, that, and, and we are satisfied and that God would move us to give not because we have to, but because we want to. Listen, friends, I'm generous because God is generous to me. I'm generous because I'm treasured by him. Last story, praise team is going to come up pretty soon. This past week and a half, I've had a privilege of just playing with my two daughters, two and a half year old Emily, five year old Eliana. I love them. They are, they are sweet little girls. <laughs> there were times where I was thankful. You know, I, I lost my Apple Watch in, at Camp Akiti in the water. It was horrible. And I didn't like how I couldn't disconnect from my text messages. So I got a, this, I don't know, is this a Fitbit, Charge 5, so I could detach myself from my phone. I remember leaving my phone in the counter and said, you know what, I'm just going to enjoy playing basketball, shooting, you know, shooting a little basketball in a little box with Eliana and just uh, playing with my girls. And there were moments where I thought to myself, wow, this is so fun. This is so fun playing with my kids, jumping around, laughing. And there, were, there was this moment, you know that moment, some of you understand this, parents and even grandparents. Uncle Bing told us last week at our elders meeting, he said that the, grand, the grandkids can't wait to go sledding. They love the snow. You know that feeling? When you're, that moment that you can never buy back, which I know is going to only last for a short window, so I'm trying to enjoy with all my heart right now. That moment, the moments where we play hide and seek and they find me, that laughter on their face, when they, they tickle me, and when we giggle, I hear through their laughter, Daddy, you are worth it. Daddy, we love you. Daddy, we treasure you. And because I'm treasured by my daughters, you think I'm going to spend my time and my treasure to make sure that they're happy? Absolutely. I give because I'm treasured. And my last question, friends, is who does God treasure? The text says this, verse 34, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where is God's treasure? And if you look in the mirror in your bathroom today, you're looking at him. You're looking at her. You are his treasure. You're his treasure, which gives you satisfaction, which unlocks a generous and a giving heart. You, my friend, are his treasure. How do I know? Where is his heart? His heart was broken because he treasures me, because he loves me. And the very foundational verse of this entire passage is verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure, his happiness, his delight to give you the kingdom. It is del his delight to give you himself because he treasures you more than a woodpecker. And so there's some here, you're struggling. There's some here this morning, you may be thinking, I am, I am, I'm, I'm bad goods. I'm not worth anything. Let me tell you something. Jesus says you are worth something. You're worth something because he gave his life for you. You're treasured by him. And if there's someone here who needs to receive that treasure, the treasure of Jesus in their heart, we have a connect card. We have a connect card for you. You can fill out, hey, I want to begin a relationship with Jesus. Give us your, your contact information. Those of you watching online, you can use the QR code. Let us know. We want to come alongside you in your journey as a pastoral team. Fill out the connect card. You can drop it off in the offering plate on your way out as, our, uh, as uh, our deacons or even as our deacons collect our tithe and offering. You're treasured by him. Jesus 
is our all in all. And he's willing to give his all for you. So our praise team is going to sing together. Let's sing to the God who loves us and treasures us so much. Let's pray. Oh, Father, you are our all in all. You are the treasure that we seek. And why do we treasure you? Because you treasure me. You treasure us. So, Lord, unlock the gospel in our hearts. Unlock generosity, especially in this season. And I pray that you would unlock your grace upon the recipients of the pies and of the blessing bags that we have. May people be blessed and receive a blessing. May we be also receive a blessing as we bless others. We bless your name above all names. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, you may be seated. Jason, our head elder, is going to come up here and give us instructions of how we're going to bless others today. All right, you guys. So in order to, to make this as smooth as possible, um, don't all come at once, but we're going to do A through J on this side. It's going to be, Rochelle's going to be here. If you ordered pies, she'll know about it. They'll give you your pies. 
And so we'll do K through Z on the left. And K through Z is going to be Auntie Malu, I believe. They will give you your pies. And if you didn't sign up, Sandra's going to be on the left corner here. Just ask her. There's some extra. So she's happy to give you what we have, okay? Second of all, we'd love for you to grab a bag. Notice there's a number on the bag. There is another bag in the lobby that has fresh goods like milk and eggs and potatoes. You got to match the two. Okay. I guess I see milk coming in here right now. But there's still a second bag out in the lobby. So if you grab this bag, there's a number, correspond the number in the lobby. Okay, you with me? So you can grab any bags you want. We'd love at least for each family to take one and then go deliver it. Okay, so if you have any questions, just ask us. But I'm going to have Rochelle come up here right now, Auntie Malou and Sandra. Get into your positions. We'll just mingle a little together. We'll sing together and then just...